Hello and welcome to Counterculture. I'm Peter Whittle. Now, today we're filming this in the centre of London. It's pretty deserted. In fact, it's as deserted as it was in March, really, at the beginning of the official lockdown. There are a great many fears now about the future for London. But not just London, which of course accounts for something like 25% of Britain's GDP. What about the other cities around our country? And indeed internationally, is the era of cities over? If they do survive, what will they look like? Now, with me to discuss this, I'm very pleased we have Austin Williams from the Future Cities Project, Robert Pohl, who is a property developer and might well be known to you as well as the founder of the Save Our Statues Twitter campaign, and Rafe Hadelman Koo of the New Culture Forum, historian, commentator, and also author of a book about particular aspects of British London history called A London Peculiar. Um, can I start by asking you, please, uh, Austin, uh, are cities dying? Uh, it's a tricky question, isn't it? Because obviously in the current situation with coronavirus, there has been an economic collapse, which has seen uh, the centres of cities hollowed out. Um, but that's not the same way as you might have seen uh, in, in the last 20 years of shrinking cities or in 40 years uh, of people moving to the suburbs um, and, and, and kind of a conscious exodus in some ways. This is a much more kind of anarchic, um, and nihilistic and, and dangerous kind of trend, which is that people have given up in some ways on the city in many respects. One is it's given up on the city as a metropolitan arena of culture, of a center of excellence, of productivity. So a lot of that has been given up. They've been given up in as much as uh, the idea that we should give back to nature and the cities are somehow an abomination uh, where you know we've trampled over nature and now some people are seeing the benefits of the coronavirus uh, pandemic by saying that we can allow nature to reclaim the city. Uh, and in some ways, there's the idea that uh, cities, by building cities or by creating cities, that's uh, uh, an expression of, of uh, humanity's hubris. So on, on in, in a cultural terms, in philosophical terms, I suppose, we're living in a very weird, dangerous age where the city, the concept of the city, in somehow has been kind of undermined. And I think it needs to be reclaimed for all the very reasons, the opposite reasons that I've just described. Um, it's interesting, Austin, because you see, I've always thought of the city uh, in the abstract as being kind of, you know, the expression of civilization, actually. Um, and so I would regret the fact that it appears to be, therefore, declining. I mean, would you agree with that? Do you see them in that way or do you see them as hubris, as you just said? Sorry, I hope I was making myself clearer than I obviously was. No, they are centres of excellence. Uh, cities are um, cultural hubs. They are a symbol of civilization. Obviously, the opposite of a city is rurality. Uh, and that idea of, you know, feudal life or living off the land is something which I thought we put behind us. And the move towards the city has always been an expression of development. If you take a look at China, I mean, China has only recently, maybe in the last seven years or so, um, become 50 percent, it's now 61 percent urbanized. And that is a symbol. That's a very clear national expression of their development above what they were 40 years ago, which was peasants in the fields. So, I mean, on, on all levels, cities have been expressions of development, of civilization, of cultural um, um, progress. Uh, and I think those things need to be put on, back on the agenda. Partly what I'm saying is, is that the words development, the word progress is always um, characterized uh, in quotation marks. And it's a very dangerous trend that we have seem to be giving up on those things, which is why in some ways the fact that now cities are being hollowed out has been accepted by many people. There's an almost blasé-ness to the fact that London is empty. Uh, the idea that we now look to cities like Delhi and say, isn't it wonderful, the clean air and we can see the mountains. This is, a, this is an abomination. Uh, I think the fact that cities are congested, in some ways they are cluttered and they're uncomfortable and they're ugly, is, a, is the beauty of them. Um, and if we give up on that, then um, I mean, we're, we're just going backwards. And that's something we have to stop. I think something there that uh that um, about London, basically, uh, you know, people not really caring or seeming to care. 
Do, do you agree with this? This is something that strikes me. I've, I've been very surprised by how people are quite happy just to, you know, as Austin put it, kind of give up on the thing, Rafe. Yes, and I think something which I would point out as being rather a different to what we've seen historically, because, of course, people have always escaped from the cities during times of pandemic and pestilence for centuries. If you look at that, you know, the great medieval text, the, the Decameron, the Florentines went into the Tuscan countryside to escape the Black Death, and but then came back. Cities have survived for millennia, enduring plague and pestilence, and have always bounced back, despite having huge swathes of their population decimated during those and whereas what we see today is, is nothing in, by comparison, however, we have this extraordinary reaction from, from, from the populations of these cities. Of course, we have technology now that makes it not, not, not as essential or necessary to be part of the city, but it is this giving up, you know, and you often wonder, where is that London that um, I was born into, and I think all three of us here are, are Londoners born and bred, you know, but that old Blitz spirit, it was, it was Churchill who said, the maxim of the British people is business as usual, and that was coined for the Blitz, and it just seems as if we've, we've, lo we've lost that. This is no longer the city that it once was. Robert, would you agree with that? I mean, do you, do you find that you are saddened by what's happening with London at the moment, or are you matter-of-fact about it? Um, definitely agree with it and would say sad and yes I mean if you and agree with what you said about the city as a as a mark of civilization um, if you look back through history when people have built cities they're not just building shelter or somewhere to live they're, they're also constructing a story about themselves and identity uh, about themselves as well the, the decisions they make the, the way they choose to build um, the style they build in the types of buildings they put up um, the types of monuments they put up, all these things um, come together to form an identity. Mm -hmm. And if you look at some of the rise and falls of civilizations over time, I think it's notable that um, I think the rise and the fall, can, they, can, they, can, they can begin and end with the city, really. It begins when people coalesce, they come together, um, they work together and share ideas and create that environment where you can prosper and um, innovate. Um, and build and then conversely they can also the city can also be the, the seat of the end of, or the, the decline of, of the civilization so if you look at um, the decline and fall of Rome as an obvious example um, yes it fell when they lost in battle to the Goths and the Vandals but the, really they'd lost that way before they even went to the battlefield you know it was, it was because of the decline that had been taking place in Rome um, for so long um, that they that they that they lost that, and really, I mean, that was probably for th for three reasons. Yeah. Um, I would say it was um, there was a economic collapse, um, there was a um, political collapse, and there was also a moral collapse. Um, and we're seeing elements of those things now in in London. Um, economic collapse we talked about with the with the virus. Um, politically, um, well, I think it's true certainly that over the last recent decades people have um, lost a lot of faith in the political class um, but I think more interestingly morally um, we're seeing um, with Rome it was the um, introduction of Christianity really I think which obviously brought many benefits but also Gibbon talks a lot about how that led to the undermining of the of the value system mm -hmm. in Rome and I think that's what we're now starting to see quite a lot of with um, we've talked about attacks on statues and other things um, and um, the, the values that we um, that we that we held as a as a people, things like um, achievement and um, uh, courage, and these these kind of things that we've held as good values for so long, have suddenly been um, undermined really by the imposition of a new religion. Not in this sense Christianity, but really the kind of religion of of wokeism, I suppose, that is that is replacing those values um, with new ones. Yes, I think it's interesting, isn't it? Because, you know, if you try to capture the essence of London, what it might be, uh, maybe a few generations ago, it would have been something that had grown up organically, i.e. a shared story, a shared history. Now, if you, a Londoner is basically defined by somebody, as somebody who signs up to a whole set of values, you know, rather nebulous, but that's how, that's how it is. I mean, would you say, uh, Austin, that, you know, there's been this narrative 
that London is is just great place that everywhere else should emulate. And therefore, what that seems to have done is to have fostered a hell of a lot of hostility to London from outside. You know, you, you feel it and we see it in comments and, uh, on the channel. You know, people are sick to death of hearing about how great London is. Do you think people outside London think it's sort of getting its just comeuppance? Um, well, I don't, I don't, I'm not too sure about that. I mean, obviously there is an animosity um, that is built up uh, with Brexit. And I'm sure that there's plenty of people on the other side of the channel who um, have an equal and opposite kind of view about the UK and, and, its, uh, and its metropolitan elite. Um, but but, but just to go, I want to just go back quickly on what you just said earlier, because I think that the characterization of the city is very interesting. From There's a very great, great book called um, The Soul of London by Ford Maddox Ford, which was written 120 years ago. Um, one of the first kind of modernist um, analyses of, uh, of urban geography in some respects. Um, and it's just really interesting because he, can, he explores the city of London at that transition point uh, as Victorian Britain was coming to an end. And he kind of, you know, he cycles in, he takes buses, he takes a car, he walks. Um, and he takes a look at the boundaries and the framework, and he effectively he still doesn't really understand what London is, but he knows it when he sees it. There's a metropolitan spirit uh, to to uh, the, the, the city, to the capital, and there's also a wonderful aspect of um, you can have hidden lives within the city. So it's a very public arena, but you can also go back and you can be a private citizen. Um, and so that's one thing which I think is important to realise, the metropolitanness, because the difference between a city and the opposite um, is, is characterised in urban studies um, by being opposite to the rural, by being, a, a, so that's one context. The other context is the number of people in a certain area. You can then define it as being not a town, but a city. But the third aspect, which is the indefinable one in some respects, is that kind of cultural uh, or multicultural um, shift which takes place between you know, what you would expect to have in a village or a town and, a, and, a, and an agglomeration of, of, of many people. So I'm much more interested in that third representation of the cultural metropolitan spirit which is an indefinable thing, but you know it when you see it, uh, as opposed to maybe just a characterization of the number of people living in a certain area. So when, once you have that, then you are defining your city context on, the, on certain beliefs that London represents, whether it represents the blitz spirit has been mentioned, whether it represents kind of the history of, of Churchill and before, or whether it just represents a wonderfully um, multicultural city to enjoy. Uh, you know, and that's, I think that's kind of really important. The fact that many other people now look to, to London and say, you know, it's dirty, it's congested, um, you know, it has kind of all kinds of social problems, etc. So be it. That's what comes with city development. Uh, and I think we, we, have, we have to take the rough with the smooth when we talk about cities. And for me, you know, like New York, uh, Paris, Shanghai, uh, London, these are cities which are robust. Uh, they have their problems, but that's part of the joy. I think. Would you go along with that, Rafe? I mean, do you think that the metropolitan spirit of London was a happy one even before COVID? I think it was a happy one if you had money. <laughs> and if you were part of the professional class, I think it was very much so. Um, unfortunately, I mean, there are, there, there are many Londons, and there have always been many Londons, depending on where you're from and what your interests are and, and so forth. But what I've seen, ironically, is with the increased heterogenization of London has become increasingly homogenized, by which I mean there's been a sterilization of culture in London over the course of the past 30 odd years, as it's become too expensive for people from the artistic or creative communities, for example, to continue to live in London. There was a time in the, in the 90s when there was an act, and in the 2000s when there was no chance of the, the creative types of East London going to Berlin. But um, now there are more of them living in Berlin because rents there are a quarter of the price that they are in London. And London has gone through this process whereby all of those wonderful corners that I think epitomised the, 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 the glory of London was its different areas, whether you were in Hampstead or in Southwark, but all of the parts of central London that had those wonderful, glorious spirit of, the old, of, of old London have been gentrified and, 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 and essentially now resemble Zurich on steroids, really, mm -hmm. just places for management consultants and lawyers and bankers and people involved in the professional world uh, to live in. And the working classes have been pushed out and completely erased from the 
from, from, the, from the visual scene in central London, now having to commute from zone six at five in the morning to do jobs in central London. And so there's been this sterilization, I think, of, of London, which is now chrome and steel. And, and that beating heart that I liked, whether you were a, a, a Cockney costermonger from the East End or a Duchess from Belgravia, uh, you had that wonderful spirit in London or an arty from, from, from Hampstead. Or, but, and that's lost and gone, I think. Now it's been replaced by multiculturalism. And so we, we now have you know, Russian oligarchs where there were duchesses. And we have in, in Tower Hamlets now the Cockneys have gone and been replaced by Bangladeshis. But the the problem I'm finding is that no one actually has any knowledge of the history of London. And so for me as a historian, it's that idea that is a city still a city if there's no collective memory, if nobody knows about the Great Fire of London, if nobody actually knows that, you know, that you know, Tom Bride's Fleet Street has connections with Shakespeare and Milton and, and, and all the rest of it. And to me, London then seems to be less than it was, and it simply becomes a capital of the world rather than the capital of England. And it's its status as capital of England that I think um, is, is most important. So ironically, in a way, I do wonder whether a silver lining to COVID might be the fact that with office rents uh, plummeting, as they will do, I'm convinced, over the next, you know, over the next few months, you may see over the next five, ten years, rents and life in London becoming easier and cheaper and more affordable. So there might be actually a chance to actually bring back some of the, the artistic and cultural and less professional side to London. Would you go along with that, Rob? Yeah, um, I'd, I'd agree certainly with the idea of sterilisation and the loss of that um, sense of history and identity, coming back to what I said earlier about the city telling story really about what that people is and if you, if you lose that then you lose part of your identity uh, and yes we're seeing that in the architecture in many ways um, we're now seeing in recent years obviously a increasing series of well, increasingly grotesque skyscrapers I think in my view dotted around the city breaking up disrupting that urban fabric um, where you once had areas with some kind of cohesion of how they looked in terms of style and, and size how tall these buildings were um, that's that's disrupted. When you look at the older photographs or drawings of London, um, you, you feel something about the identity of what that city is, um, which I think is lost now. Um, and um, yeah, I think I think it it is it's breaking down that identity, and we're seeing that um, they're now it's being replaced with something a lot more amorphous, I suppose. When we look at the statues again, um, they're getting rid of the historical ones and replacing them with these amorphous blobs like the fourth plinth or an anonymous every woman statue which maybe on some superficial level someone says oh that's a reflection of me but it's it's not really a reflection of your identity it yes. doesn't reflect your past exactly. Exactly. it doesn't reflect your future what you aspire to these things are being lost and the population is a transient one as well that's what I, there's, there's no vested interest that i see now from from the middle classes from anybody in the city now and from the wealthy as they used to be when they would patronize and be great philanthropists to me that's all gone there's no longer a vested interest in london by those people who are here well i mean this is the, the crucial point you know we you mentioned there if, about the Duchess and the costermonger, was it? Um, but I mean, we're getting very baroque here. But uh, but I, you know, famously, Noel Coward's song "London Pride" was exactly that. It was you know from the rich to the anchor and crown. Mm -hmm. And as Londoners, I sort of let's say bought into that. You felt it. You absolutely felt it. But it seems to be that now many people don't actually feel welcome in in London. I mean, people who were maybe were grew up here or whatever, because enormous numbers of people are leaving. And uh, for example, in, in my case, in the, in the summertime, you know, there was no movement in the property market during the COVID thing until we had these big demonstrations and then some social unrest and they went berserk. And it was people basically, I assume, moving out. I think, I mean, this is one of the problems, isn't it, Austin, that, you know, if people move out, you know, whether it's to work at home or not, this is a, a bad, you know, this is a bad trend for any city. Uh, you know, working from home could actually be be the death of the city, couldn't it? Of course, of course, of course. But um, the, the unreality of me being on a TV screen while you're all having a kind of um, rough and tumble Barney around the table. Can I just chip in on one thing that was said earlier and yeah. then I'll come back to your question, which yeah. is that one, two things. One, one is, first of all, 
I think I've mentioned multicultural city. I don't support multiculturalism. Um, I find multiculturalism a divisive policy, whereas multicultural nature of society is, is wonderfully warming, I think. Um, secondly, I'm a great believer in gentrification. Uh, it's about improving areas that um, that are down and out and bring, lifting them up. The fact that there are, you know, there are victims as well as um, successors to that policy is obviously um, a, a tragedy, and maybe there should be there should be more of it. Um, but but in some ways, there's a there's a counter response in the urban design world and architecture world where people are celebrating the kind of poverty of the areas and giving a certain nostalgic romanticism uh, and saying we should preserve it. Uh, whereas actually, I think they should be lifted out of poverty and that takes development and progress and uh, innovation. So, so the, 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 the fundamental to the question, uh, the earlier question is that the shift in what's happened, as, as Robert was saying about this kind of moral collapse, Historically, you might have seen moral collapse because there was something else on the agenda on, on offer. There was a, you know, from the Greeks to the Romans, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, there was a there was a developmental motif. Whereas now you find that the the, the driving focus is nihilism, is that there is no agenda. It's just a destruction of what is. Uh, I mean, I hate to can use the parody of ISIS, but you know there is something kind of strange going on here where there's a, a refutation of what we stand for without putting anything in its place. Uh, as a matter of fact, thinking that putting something in its place would be even worse. So there's a, a risk-averse precautionary approach to, to, um, to development. But coming back to that, that kind of final point about uh, the movement, obviously it depends, you know, if you, if you are in a nihilistic age, then people moving out becomes part of the problem. Uh, whereas if you look back to Alvin Toffler, say in the 1970s, talking about the wonderful science fiction opportunities of telecottaging, as he put it, you know, living in villages and commuting to London virtually, that was innovative, that was science fiction, that was futuristic, that was great. And, I, you know, I love that concept. So, you know, you can't throw the baby out of the bathwater. I think there is something about what's happened, which is, you know, that here we are, I'm having a chat with you in a studio, and I'm a long way away. There's something kind of fascinating about the democratization and the, the, the fact that this technology has become accessible to everybody. That's great. But the, but the reasons why it has is an absolute tragedy. Uh, and so therefore, we have to kind of try and just dissect those two things. The fact that people are moving out of London for whatever reasons is a, is a scandal. Um, and I think that employers, um, are as much to blame as the people themselves. So, you know, the fact that employers are allowing people to swan around and not come back, that nobody's being forced to come back to their businesses, uh, that city centres are being kind of cleared out of, of workers and nobody is demanding that they go back. So there's, there's, there's a collapse of nerve in this conversation as well, which I think we need to need to address. So it's not just, you know, the city is moving on like it always has done historically, where rich people move to the city centre and poor people move out and, and then that transforms itself when when the rich people move to the suburbs, the poor people come back again. Now that's been a historical movement in most cities for the last 200, 300 years. This is different, right? This is a collapse of a belief in the city, which is, I think, uh, something which history has never shown us before. We said that, that we are actually talking really here, I would say, about a central London issue. Because if you actually look mm -hmm. at local businesses in the suburbs and outer areas, um, there you aren't seeing the same devastation of the high streets. Local shops are actually uh, you know, showing some, some improvement in their business fortunes because all the office workers are actually staying at home and going for coffee to the local area or going to the local, to the local, to the local W. H. Smiths or whatever. It's those shops in the centre of town which which are a problem. And that's why I think, you watch, I mean, one of the glories of London also, as I said, is the fact that it is a series of villages, you know, 30 odd villages that were absorbed into the, the greater city. And so this idea which you have in Paris also of the, of the 15 minute city, where basically everything you do is within the local region. So you've got your, your doctor, everything you need is around you, rather than traveling great distances. You know, people living in Ealing have no idea what life's like in Barking. They probably know more about places in Africa than they do about Barking because London is so vast. And I think that's one of the things which we're going to see, at least in the short term, is people staying very much in the suburbs, but also in their areas. And so the economy as a whole isn't, that isn't as bleak, but it's going to just basically have to reevaluate itself. Because what we've seen really is just a fast forwarding of the inevitable decline of the high street and retail because of, because of online shopping and so forth. But it was a, a 10 or 15 year process has been sped up with, no, with not much time for, for an adjustment. I think it's quite interesting. This, this, yeah, yeah, sorry, Austin, you come sure. in. 
Well, English, sorry, I, I know it's, too, it's impossible to chip in, but uh, see, I, I, I reject that, right, because that's a reinvention of the rural as far as I'm concerned. I mean, I, I'm, I don't believe in the 15-minute city. I don't agree with kind of uh, localism. It's, a, it's, a, it's, an, it's an apology. No offence to you. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying you're saying this, but historically for the last 20 years, uh, from Richard Rogers onwards, the idea that you create this kind of la less dense city means what? That you're going to go back to creating urban villages. I thought we created cities to, to get out of villages. So the idea that we're creating, I don't mind we have local areas that we can all relate to, but conceptually, I think that we have to consider the metropolitan as a coherent body rather than a fractured region of satellites, because that is the destruction of the city itself. Oh, I agree with you entirely. You know, the, the great urban historian H.J. Dios wrote about the suburbia and said it combines the worst elements of the city and the countryside and the best elements of neither. And it's rather of a vacuum. So I'm entirely in keeping with you on that. I'm merely saying what I think is actually the reality on the ground. Can I just uh, point out here, you're talking about why people go and, and the money and everything. Can we be frank about this? When you talk to so many people about why, in this case, they're moving out of London. It is for much more, if you like, nitty gritty reasons. They're sick of the crime, for example, which appears not to be able to be managed in any way, let alone punished. Uh, they, are, they are sick too, obviously, of the sheer cost of it. They're sick of the overcrowding, the extraordinary overcrowding there is, and they feel increasingly that it's not familiar. And not only that it's not familiar, but that they shouldn't want it to be familiar. That's a crucial point, that if you somehow feel that, you know, if you don't feel that anyone living in London is a Londoner, then somehow you are not wanted on journey, as my father would say. You know, hence people are actually leaving because they no longer recognise it. Do you accept that? Me? Uh, not, not really. I mean, I think uh, London has probably been more crime ridden. Uh, in the 1970s than it is today, even though there's a different scale and a different problem uh, to be addressed. I think that overcrowding, you know, if you look back historically, 1939 was the most overcrowded time for London's housing. Um, we then moved to the suburbs in the 1960s and the population went down. The fact that then infrastructure hasn't kept up and there's been road closures, so there's increased traffic congestion. I mean, it's an interesting fact that nobody ever believes when I tell you, is that in 1964, you had the same number of cars on the streets in London as you have in 19, uh, 2020. Uh, you know, there's, there hasn't been any decline. It's just the fact that the, the amount of road space has disappeared. So it's, it appears worse. And we're also culturally attuned to seeing congestion as a problem rather than being a factor of, of city life. So I just think that, you know, the nature of the conversation has, has changed. I think that, you know, people are moving out for all kinds of reasons, partly because they've given up on maybe what... It means to live in a city and they, they you know they, they whatever i mean there's, there's there's many reasons and i don't think we can use lowest common denominator um excuses to to to, to talk about the, the general trends but i also think that there's a a, a, a mood within the um, metropolitan area of having more foreign people within it is has always been a good thing, I think. It's always been a sense, that's, that's what it means to be a world city. If you go to Singapore, uh, it's kind of one of those wonderful experiences where you can almost see the future of what a city could be because it's, 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 it's all shades, all populations, all countries are, 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 are engaging in the city there. And it's just marvelous to watch. And you see this kind of uh, cultural yeah but, but, uh, yeah, but I mean, I would go back to uh, Rafe's original point. That, that all sounds very nice on paper, surely, Austin, but the fact is if you do have a situation where the story of a city, no, you, people no longer know it. They no longer, they don't have to know it for a start. So I don't just mean that the history of the Tower of London, everything. I mean the cultural nuances of a city. Absolutely. Uh, when all of those things start to go, and it, to me then it just becomes, does it not, a kind of landing strip? It just becomes like a, an airport departure lounge. I mean, it's all very well that you've got this glistening economic activity, but no one has any real sense of place there. Hence, I would suggest they can give it up very easily, which is what we're seeing. That's fair enough, isn't it?
Well, that's fair enough. I mean, I think so they, so they can give it up, and so they can move on, so they can tra travel around. I don't have a problem. I don't think people have ever had this idea of knowing their history in the way that you seem to be suggesting. I mean, I, I'm, I'm dreading the fact you might test me uh, on my knowledge of certain street names and all the rest of it, because I, I don't have it myself. And one thing about London, which has been always been a phenomenon, and less so in the last 10 years when the buses have really kind of taken off, is that people have traveled by underground and have never conceptualized distance time or the relationship of different areas because you go down underground and you pop up where you want to be and you don't really understand where you are that to me the mystery of london is is part of the uh, part of the enjoyment of it there is a problem when a city is so transient when people come in here for a relatively short period of time they may be here for 5 10 15 years and then they move on because of their their, their jobs in the city and so forth because you do lose those those community roots that are essential not only to a sense of what it means to be a londoner but what it means to be somebody from from you know from southwark or from or from you know from hanwell or whatever else there, there, there are those really vital community bonds which are completely being erased and eradicated you know i've i, I can't think of a single city in modern history which has in the space of 20 years gone from being a majority indigenous population to a minority indigenous population. London now ranks as the second or third most multicultural city in the world apart from there's Toronto, New York and London are the three most multicultural cities in the world in terms of the where people were born but those cities were not always immigrant cities. Britain, I mean London's always had a small immigrant population but the speed of which it happened and, and the space of 20 years in which it happened is unprecedented and that's discombobulated as a society and that's one of the reasons that you, you have this evidence of white flight taking place. I mean, in Barking and Dagenham, it was amazingly uh, numbers. I can't remember, but in the double digits in the space of in the space of a few years leaving because of that sense of no longer recognising their their place. A friend of mine, you know, was 50 years working in one of the gentlemen's clubs in St James's, said he was the only person left on his street who hadn't arrived there within the space of the last 15 or so years. You know, and I've often jokingly said, if the Cockneys had been a tribe in the Amazon, the UN would have sent a forced in to preserve them <laughs> but yet here they're in the urban jungle and no one seems to care that they've been displaced after centuries of living in one location um I th you would disagree with that austin would you not well yes but i, I only shouted i mean sorry i've been speaking too much uh, i shouted out shenzhen uh, which in 1985 was a was a series of villages uh, of uh, 30,000 people and it's now a city of 15 18 million people uh, so the speed of transition um, that London is vi visit is seeing has got nothing on what China has done. Um, obviously, <laughs> it has an authoritarian state to help it on its way. I appreciate that, um, but you know, I think that. But there and, and, and there are and there are problems, you know, social problems that come with that loss of history. I understand all of those things, but in some ways, if you have a dynamic sense of progress and where you want to be, then you can carry people with you. I remember, I'm old enough to remember the 1960s uh, when my local village in South Wales was, you know, having houses built when the motorway was being built, when we could then travel to Cardiff much more quickly. And it was a joy. We saw that as progress, that we were no longer isolated, that we were then going to be connected to the wonderful metropolis of Cardiff. Uh, if you excuse the uh, expression, but, uh, you know, but you know, we lost something. Right? We lost something, but that loss was more than compensated by the gains that we had because we saw the future in a positive light. I think what we have today is seeing the future in such a negative. We, saw tr we have so much trepidation about visiting the future that we therefore want to safeguard what we have or look back to the past in some kind of, uh, in some kind of nostalgic way. That's the problem. It's the, it's, the, it's the perspective, I think, which is wrong. Um, well, what do you sort of think? What do you see at the future? In I mean... What, if you take how it is now, how it is going at the moment, you know, when you look forward, are you, do you look forward and think uh, with some kind of optimism or do you think actually it's not going to be a place that I particularly want to be in anymore? I mean, you, you were born here you, and you, you live here like we all do. Yeah. Um, well, I suppose just following on from what you were saying, I mean, there's, there'll always be an element of churn in a city of people passing through in any healthy, successful mm. city. Um, but it's not to say it doesn't also need an element of the population that's a bit more firmly rooted and has a longer term interest in it. I think you, know, you need both. You need both those things, really. Um, for the future, I, I don't know. I think it's, yes, it's not so much um, well, immigration per se as it is perhaps the, the lack of identity. That's what you were, mm. you were saying. It's the, um, perhaps that multiculturalism when, when there's a loss of, of a kind of a, a more 
um, overarching London identity with, um, uh, that is the problem. Um, and uh, yeah, I don't know, I think I'm fairly pessimistic, I suppose, about the future uh, in that respect. Um, well, you know, when I walk on my way to, uh, to come here, when I walk from my uh, flat uh, to the station, there is this brand spanking new Crossrail station for Woolwich there, which was obviously meant to open last year originally, uh, then this year, now it's going to be in apparently 2022, you know, I'll wait and see until that happens. But there's, you've got this sort of feeling, wait a minute, if you were actually looking at transport now and the way London is now after COVID, you wouldn't build this thing. You just wouldn't build this thing uh, because it's just that the whole thing has changed so much there won't be the number of people to actually uh, to use it. So, I mean, I, I am quite pessimistic about it. Ray, for you? Or? Well, it's interesting because car travel is more or less back to pre-COVID levels, as is bicycling. It's public transport. That's the real issue here. And whereas in most cities, about half of people uh, commute to work in public transport. Here it's 80%. Mm -hmm. And there's still that fear of public transport. That's the issue. Mm -hmm. So it remains to be seen whether whether actually things do improve. I, I'm, not that, I'm not as pessimistic. And of course, if people are watching this and thinking, well, why does any of this matter to me, whether or not people can get to work on the, on the trains or not, it's because if London was an independent mm. country, it would almost be in the G20 of, 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 of economies, you know? Mm. It's, it's, it's a quarter of the country's um, economic output comes through London, and one third of the tax take for the nation. I mean, just as Britain was a net contributor to the, to the EU, London is a net, is a net mm. contributor, so everybody in the country really has a vested interest in, 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 see, in seeing London thrive, um, as long as it's you know, thriving in the right way. Although I think a lot of people actually now are, are actually, you know, uh, rubbing their hands. They, they think that London's been way too arrogant for way too long. Um, anyway, I still, I guess, love it. I was only going to throw in, just for the sake of saying it, uh, the famous Gramsci quote, of pessimism of the intellect, optimism of the will. So, no, we, in our in our minds, we know that things are looking bleak. But in our in our human abilities to transform things, we should be optimistic. Well, that's a that's a very we we we've been talking a lot about Gramsci actually on this program recently, Austin. But never heard that one before actually. So great, thank you. Look, listen, Austin. Thank you very much for joining us this morning. Thanks so much, Robert. Thanks, Rave. Um, that's it for Counterculture this week. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we mentioned the Save Our Statues campaign uh, at the very beginning of the programme. Please do subscribe, won't you? Um, and uh, join us. It's been great to see how much support there is for that campaign. Saveourstatues.org.uk or uh, at Save Our Statues uh, on Twitter. And of course, please do subscribe to our show and channel, won't you? Uh, we still want you to do that. So uh, see you next time. Thank you.